I am just a dork who doesn't know how to load the dishwasher. I am the guy who needs to work out more. The man is the head, but the woman is the neck. And she can turn the head any way she wants. You just said that you want me to help you do the dishes. I want you to want to do the dishes. Why would I want to do dishes? Does that land home with anybody? Too true. We're going to be uh, getting to that clip, uh, the middle clip about the head and the neck a little bit later on in this message. Um, We're going to be talking about marriage. We're doing a series uh, called Relatively Speaking. And we're looking at a kingdom perspective on all relationships and a kingdom perspective on, on relatives. And what we've seen so far is that, that uh, the kingdom, having a kingdom frame, framework, assessing things from a kingdom perspective, uh, changes everything. It changes how we think about honoring m- mother and father. We saw that. We, it changes how we uh, think about being single. And it changes how we think about courtship. And today we're going to see how it changes or should change how we think about and how we do marriages. But it applies to all relationships, so even if you're not married, uh, I encourage you to be tuning in on this. Uh, There's some important stuff we're going to be covering. Uh, Sometimes I give messages that are more motivational or emotive, kind of addressing the heart. Other times, uh, they're more teaching times where they're content-driven. And this is one of those kind of messages, so I'm going to ask you to really tune in uh, and in about 10, 15 minutes, it's going to start to get kind of thick. First 10 minutes are they're pretty light, but they, they're going to re- it's going to require your, your, your mind here in a little bit. So uh, um, pay attention to this. For some folks, this will be review. Uh, for others, it's going to be, I suspect, very new. And I will encourage you especially, when, it's, when you're learning new stuff, it it's, it's sometimes doesn't come easy. This is a paradigm for marriage that I believe is just pure kingdom and yet it's very different from what uh, is often given in, in Christian circles, so, so be tuning in on this. I'm going to entitle this message, Reversing the Curse of Marriage. Reversing the Curse of... And I, I, actually, we're, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying marriage is cursed, I'm saying reversing the curse in, in some marriages. <laughs> well, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a little bit. Uh, and actually, we're going to have a two-part series on this. Uh, uh, we're going to span this series one week because as we're putting this together, I realize there's, I, I wanna, I'm going to address the paradigm for marriage this week, and the next week we'll talk about conflict in marriage and, and divorce in remarriage. So you want to come back for that. And it also will have principles that apply uh, to, to, to everyone. But pray with me here for a moment. Abba, Father, uh, we are your children, and some may be here today or listening through podcasts who are not your children, at least they're not uh, yet submitted to you, and we pray that this message would be used to uh, draw them in, draw them closer. But God, we just acknowledge that uh, you are our Lord, and we love you, and we pray, God, that this message would be used to further your will, to bring the kingdom into our marriages to bring the kingdom into all of our relationships, to transform us, uh, God, to take us out of the Egypt of the culture and into the promised land of your kingdom. And all that that entails, and all of its beauty, use this message, God, to further your will in Jesus' name. And all of God's kids said, amen, 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 amen. Okay, let's start again by reviewing what we've covered so far. We've seen that in the first century, the father defined the family. In the first century Jewish culture, and this is true of most cultures throughout history, not all, but most, the father defined the family. Uh, the father had total authority over the family. Uh, the, the ultimate allegiance of everybody was to the, to, towards their father and the family. That was the most important allegiance uh, in the ancient world. And the job of kids, we've seen, it was to live in a way that brings honor to the father and to the family, uh, to live in a way that carries out the will of the father, and to expand the family by having kids and uh, getting married and, ha- and having kids. Jesus, we've seen, takes that patriarchal structure with the Father being overall, and he applies it to God and us. And so we've seen that when we come and we submit ourselves to God, he, he goes from being just the supreme being to being Abba, Father. And Abba is the Aramaic word that means dad. There's an intimate relationship that's created as we're born from above. 
And so now everything that was true of the earthly family in first century Jewish culture becomes true of the heavenly family. The Father defines all. Our Abba Father has authority over all. Our ultimate allegiance is to Abba and his, and, and his family, the family of all who do his will. And our job as kingdom kids is to live in a way that brings honor to Abba Father, uh, that carries out the will of Abba Father, and that expands the family of Abba Father. Uh, whether it's by having our own kids and raising them to be kingdom people, or adopting kids and raising them to be kingdom people, or we're all called to live in a way that invites others into the kingdom uh, to evangelize. Uh, the kingdom changes everything uh, about marriage. It changes everything about our life. And um, uh, we'll see that here. It, it transforms this patriarchal structure of earthly families. In the first century, and in most traditional cultures, let's talk about the family here, the husband had total authority over, over the family and over his wife. In fact, the husband virtually owned his wife. The husband purchased the wife from the male that previously owned her, and that was the father. That was that dowry system. And so the husband had total authority. And, and the primary job of the wife was to bear children and to expand the husband's family. The kingdom comes into this world, and it revolutionizes that paradigm, completely changes it. And to see how it changes it, I want us to zoom out a little bit and look at a bigger picture, a, a bigger slice of the kingdom, uh, and then we'll see where marriage fits into this. So for the next 10 minutes, we're going to zoom out just a little bit. The kingdom that Jesus inaugurated was such that when we are born from above, our total identity and all of our allegiance is to be, be to Abba and his father. That means that we're not to get our identity from anything else. We're not to be defined by anything else. And we're not to have any allegiance that competes with Abba uh, and, and with carrying out his will on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, that's our total definition. Our total allegiance is to be found in our relationship with God. Now see, in the fallen world, the world before Christ and the world that's still outside Christ, the world that's not submitted to Christ, people are defined by a lot of different things. So people have their allegiance to a lot of different things. Whatever is part of your core identity, you're going to have allegiance to. You're, you find significance in that. So people can be defined by oh, their nationality, or people can be, part of their identity might be their race, or part of their identity might be their social status. That's, when they think about themselves, that's what they think about, and so that's what's got their allegiance. Or their identity might be in their political views, how right they are, or they might be in their gender, uh, gender or they might be in their achievements, or they might be in their religion. There's a, a billion things that people can have their identity in, and whatever your identity in is where your allegiance is going to be. And so people have their allegiance to these sorts of things. For example, if, if my identity is rooted in my nationality, you know, I'm Japanese, or I'm French, or I'm Irish, well then, then, then part of your allegiance is going to be to, to uh, Japan, or to France, or to Ireland. So if anyone slanders or threatens France, or Japan, or Ireland, well, that, you get irate about that. Because whenever our, that to which we have an allegiance gets threatened, well, we, we tend to get irate, we get, we get angry, we get hostile. Or maybe my identity is in the fact that I'm a man. You know, I think I'm a male, a macho. And, and uh, if that's the case, well, then, then uh, my allegiance will be to that. I have, uh, there a lot, there's a lot of significance in that. So if someone questions my masculinity, not that anyone ever could, of course, but if someone were to question my masculinity, <laughs> or if someone were to take away or threaten my authority as a male, I would get very irate. Whenever our identity gets threatened and our allegiance gets threatened, we get irate. That's why the world outside of Christ is such a hostile world, full of violence. History's been a, a merry-go-round of violence. And the reason is because people have a, allegiances in things that they get their identity from, and they clash with one another. So we can't find this constant conflict in the world. Okay, the kingdom that Jesus came to plant, the kingdom that Jesus inaugurates, is a kingdom that does away with all those identities and does away with all that allegiance. It's radical. Because we're defined completely by our relationship with Abba, and so our whole allegiance is to Abba and to the family and to carrying out his will. And that means that we're not to invest, kingdom people, listen, we're not to invest anything else with significance. It's just not where our identity is, so it's not where our allegiance is. 
We don't have to invest any, any significance in our nationality or any significance in our race or our social status or our agenda or our achievements. Those things in the kingdom come to mean nothing. So I'm up here talking to you as an American, but if I'm thinking straight, I'm an American, that's fine, but it's not going to be the core, my core identity. It's not going to be how I identify myself. And so I'm not going to have any significant allegiance to that. So if someone slanders America or threatens America, I may not agree with them, but I, I'm not going to be irate or hostile about it because it's not, where, it's not my treasure. It's not where my heart is. It's not where my identity is. It's not where my allegiance is. Or I'm standing up here talking to you, and I'm a male, as I mentioned a little bit ago. You may have already noticed that. I'm male. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% pure hunk male, all right? Here you are. Pure male. Hmm. But if I'm thinking straight as a kingdom person, that's not going to be my identity. I'm not going to like uh, get life from that. That's not where my allegiance is. So if someone threatens my masculinity or someone threatens my position as a male, uh, I may not agree with them, but I'm not going to get hostile. I'm not going to get angry because it's not where my allegiance is. When a person derives their whole identity, their whole sense of worth and purpose and significance and security, when all of that is derived from what God thinks about you, as he's revealed it in Jesus Christ dying on the cross. When all that you are is defined by your relationship with Abba Father, well then, nothing else really matters, does it? Nothing else really matters. In the kingdom, there's simply nothing very significant about your nationality, or about your race, or about your social status, or about your gender. gender. Uh, nothing significant about what you have achieved or what you haven't achieved. It just doesn't matter. I, in the kingdom... When you're identified by your relationship with Abba Father, it doesn't matter whether you're American or Iraqi or Afghanistan or Spanish. It doesn't matter whether you're black or whether you're white or whether you're yellow. It just doesn't matter uh, where, you, where, where you've come from or what you've achieved or what you haven't achieved. It just doesn't matter uh, what your political views might be, whether you're socialist or whether you're capitalist or whether you're Democrat or whether you're Republican. It just doesn't matter because the only thing that matters is that you're a, you're a child of the king. The only thing that matters is that, that you're a kingdom kid. That you're in the kingdom. You've been born from above. When you understand that, when, when that is our identity, man, you're free from all the silly distinctions and categories that the world invests with such significance. Who cares whether you're male or female? You're, you're, you're born from above. You're in Jesus Christ. You've been washed in the blood. You're destined for heaven. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're filled with his spirit. It couldn't get better than that. All these other distinctions and rankings and hierarchies and all of that lose all their significance. Uh, they just are dwarfed in significance by the glory of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, making us his children and we're members of his family. He's the only one that claims our ultimate allegiance. And see, so the kingdom just blows up all that stuff. That's why you find in the New Testament some radical, crazy-sounding statements that are just beautiful. For example, in Colossians, I mean Galatians, Paul says this, In Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, all of you who have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. What an interesting statement. There is therefore neither Jew nor Gentile. Why? Because you've clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither slave nor free. Why? Because you've clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither male nor female. Why? Because you've clothed yourself with Christ. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we've clothed ourselves in, in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I love that. I love that passage. That's a great passage. You see, we're, we're made by, our, by having faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ. We're made children of God. We are, we are a part of Abraham's seed, a part of Abraham's uh, family. We're his descendants because Abraham is the father of all who believe. All right? So we're now made part of Abba's family. We're descendants of Abraham. And, and the way you enter the family in the, in the New Testament, and this is still true, the way that you join yourself to the family, which is the bride of Christ, the corporate bride of Christ, is through baptism. It's the initiation ceremony. It's the wedding ceremony where you're betrothed to Christ. And, and all who have been baptized in, uh, into Christ um, have, have clothed themselves with Christ. Now, the imagery there is fantastic because what Paul is getting at is this. When a person goes down into the water, uh, the word baptism is baptizo in Greek, and it means to immerse. And so when a person goes down in the water, they're clothed with the water. They're enveloped with the water. They're submerged in the water. And so also when a person joins himself to Jesus Christ and becomes part of Abba's family, you're immersed in Christ. You're clothed with Christ. You wear permanently Jesus Christ. 
And that's why everything else about you becomes insignificant. Everything else is clothed. It disappears. You can't see it anymore. You're wearing Jesus Christ. It's like I've got scars here and there on my body. I've had growths removed, and I had an accident, got a big scar here and all that kind of stuff. But, 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 but uh, that's not significant. You don't see that. Why? Because I'm wearing clothes, and you can be thankful for that. It would be a little hard to pay attention if I wasn't. Plus, it would get drafty up here. Uh, but see, I, 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 it's clothes. Now, now, maybe now you're thinking, like, what, where are your scars? Because I just mentioned it. But otherwise, you were thinking about it. It's insignificant. I'm, I'm wearing clothes. So also, when, when, you, when you put on Jesus Christ, when you're immersed in Jesus Christ, uh, Everything else about you is just kind of covered up. Your, your, your gender, your race, it just becomes insignificant. Your ethnicity, your social class, your achievements, all those kind of things, they become utterly insignificant because you're wearing Jesus Christ. And that's why he says there's neither male nor female. And throughout history, we've invested those things with a lot of significance. They have a lot of meaning and, and, and all sorts of stuff. I'll say more about that in a second. But in the kingdom, all those things are rendered insignificant. It's beautiful. It's crazy. It's wild. It's radical. Another one, another statement here is even crazier. Paul says, for now, from now on, those who are married should live as if they were not. You ever notice that in the Bible? <laughs> now, pause for a moment. Uh, Paul had just said about ten verses earlier that a husband and a wife shouldn't abstain from sex for very long because they might fall into, into temptation. So whatever he means by that statement, he's not saying don't have sex, in case you were worried. We'll get to it a little bit later on. From now on, those who are married should live as if they were not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. What an incredible passage. See, what, here's what's going on. Paul is saying that the present form of this world is, is, is the world that has all those silly distinctions and all those silly allegiances and all those false identities. It's all passing away. And so kingdom people, those who are part of Abba's fa family, we're to live now, live out now what will be true later on. We're called the first fruits of the coming kingdom, the first fruits of the coming harvest. So if the present form of the world is passing away, we're to live as though it already had passed away. We're, to, we're putting on display the kingdom that's coming in the future. So what Paul is saying here is this. If you belong to Abba's family and that's your sole allegiance and that's your sole identity, then invest no significance in whether you're married or single. It doesn't matter. Invest no significance in whether you happen to be in circumstances that cause you to mourn or good circumstances that make you happy. Sometimes you mourn, sometimes you're happy. Don't make a big deal out of it. It's insignificant. You're closed with Christ. And, and, and if you buy something, fine, but don't act like you bought it. It's not yours. It's passing away. And if you use something that you bought, fine, but, but don't, don't get engrossed in it. Don't grab onto anything. It's all passing away. The present form of this world, with all of its categories, all of its identity, all of its allegiances, it's passing away. So we kingdom people who get our identity from Abba Father and our allegiances to Abba Father, we live now as though it has passed away. It means nothing to us. It means nothing to us. This is the kingdom revolution, folks, and it's radical, and it's beautiful, and it's free. It's free because you're free from all of the allegiances and competing identities that are out there in the world. And it changes everything, and therefore it changes marriages. So now let's go back to the marriage issue. In first century culture, being a man meant a lot. It was invested with a lot of significance, and people had an allegiance to it. What it meant was that you had all the power. What it meant when you got married is that you owned your wife. That is part of the world that is passing away. That paradigm of doing marriage is part of the fallen world that's passing away. It's part of what we kingdom people are, are to live free from. Now you can see this if you go... Back just to, the, to, to, to Genesis, where after the fall, the Lord shows up and talks to Adam and Eve, and he says this to Eve. Listen to this. See, now it's going to start to thicken. The plot's going to start to thicken, so be tuning in on this. He says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Not a single amen in this place. I can't believe it. Okay, now here's the thing. This is often interpreted, in fact, I'd say throughout history, it's usually been interpreted as if that was a command, as if that was an imperative, as if God is saying this is the way marriages are supposed to be. And realize that throughout most of history, it's been men doing the interpreting, so do the math. 
Well, about 40 years ago, a woman who was a New Testament professor, and this is beginning to be a new thing, where women are starting to interpret the Bible for themselves, she noticed that this wasn't an imperative. This isn't a command. Uh, it, it, it's not a, a prescription of how things are supposed to be. This is a description of how things, in fact, are going to be. And what God is saying is because of the fall, now this wonderful plan that he had for marriage is going to be reduced to a power struggle. It's a woeful declaration of, of the sad state of marriage because of the fall. The word rule here, it, it has a connotation of conquering, subduing. The man's going to subdue the wife. Conquer the, we're thinking Neanderthal here, okay? You're going to subdue the wife, conquer the wife. And the woman's going to desire the man. Now, th that word there uh, is, is used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, uh, where it says that sin, the Lord says to Cain, sin is crouching at the door and desires you. And the connotation there is that sin wants to control you, to manipulate you. And so... Here the Lord is saying that because humans are now alienated from God, and because you're under the bondage of this serpent, the oppression of, of principalities and powers, this marriage that it was, could have been so wonderful is going to be reduced to a power struggle, where the man, because they tend to be stronger, are going, is going to be subduing the wife, but the wife then, because she can't compete usually uh, at a physical level, she's going to be using her brain on how to get her way. She's going to desire the man, to control the man. And now we're back to the clip where the guy is head, but the wife is positioning herself to be the neck that turns the head. And if you're going to do it in a, in a wise way, you, you can't let the head know that you're doing it. So you want to get the head to think that it doesn't have a neck. And so you say, oh, hi, honey, you're the boss. In the meantime, go do this. Uh, you, know, you plant the ideas and then give him the credit for it. But sadly, that's how it's been throughout history. In varying degrees, it's been this power struggle of, of one, everyone trying to get their way. By controlling the other, Jesus comes and he inaugurates a kingdom in which there is no male nor female. Jesus comes and he inaugurates a kingdom in which people don't find their identity and therefore don't have an allegiance to anything else other than Abba, Father, and doing his will. And that changes the way we do everything. All of our relationships, Paul says, in Philippians 2, he says this, let's listen, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Why? Because you're seeking to do Abba's will. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another. Note there, there's no qualification. In all your relationships with one another. Have the same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had. And then Paul goes on to talk about what that attitude was. In Philippians 2, he says that Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, by nature God, he had all the power, he had all the prerogatives. And yet, Paul says in Philippians 2, he emptied himself of that. He divested himself of the power and the privileges to become a human being and then to become a servant of humanity and then to die on a cross. That's the mindset we're to have in all of our relationships. Not, not just selfish ambition, trying to control, trying to get our way, but rather doing what Jesus did. Having the mindset of a self-sacrificial servant, putting the interest of others above our own. All of our relationships, all man-to-man -man relationships, all, uh, all, all man-to-female relationships, all, all female-to-female relationships, uh, all relationships, which include, of course, marriage relationships. Marriage is a relationship. All of it is to be characterized by the attitude that was displayed in Jesus Christ. And see, that then blows sky high this fallen paradigm of marriage, the Adam paradigm of marriage, the cursed paradigm of marriage, where everyone's trying to get their way out of selfish ambition. The man doing it through physical strength, the woman do it, doing it through her cleverness, it blows that whole paradigm apart. Okay, because now, the husband and wife are to be seeking the interest of one another, esteeming and valuing the other above themselves, submitting to one another, serving one another. Completely the opposite of what we see in Genesis 3.16. Submitting to one another. Paul says this explicitly. And the plot thickens a little bit more here. Paul says this explicitly in Ephesians 5. He says, to the husband and to the wife, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Following the example of Christ, who is our Lord, we submit to one another. The husband submits to the wife, and the wife submits to the husband. This word that's used for submit is hupotasso. 
and it means to place yourself under or to be subject to. Now, here's what it does not mean. I want to be clear on this right from the get-go. It does not mean to subject yourself to another, to, be, to submit to another, does not mean you enable them to go on in all of their dysfunctions. It does not mean that you allow a person to walk over you. It does not mean that you allow someone to be abusive towards you. Our model in everything is Jesus Christ. We always look to him, right? We're, we're to Im- imitate him. So look at how Jesus was submissive, how he did hupotasso. Sometimes when it was loving, hupotasso meant he bled. He died on the cross. All right, so love does that. But other times, Christ was very confrontational. You, you look at how he interacted with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of the religious leaders. It wasn't really meek and mousy. <laughs> no, he got big. He got he, he got huge. He got, he got angry with them. He called them vipers, brought of vipers. And he says, you blind leaders of the blind. I mean, he was, he was shocking words because that's what they needed. You see, in this case, it wasn't loving for them to go on in their religious deception and self-righteousness, leading other people into that bondage. It wasn't loving to let them do that, so he confronts them. Now, he's still coming under them, hupotasso. He's still standing under them. He's got their interest in mind. He still loves them. But now love doesn't look like meekness at all. It looks like confrontation because that's what they needed. So also. In in, in all of our relationships, we're to be doing hupotasso, coming under others. But sometimes love looks like bleeding and sacrifice and suffering even. But sometimes love looks like confrontation. And sometimes love even looks like walking away. I'm thinking here of, of, I'm speaking mainly to women, but sometimes it applies to men. If you're in a relationship where you are being walked on and, and it's, a, it's the Adam paradigm and you're being subdued and maybe being abused, and it's not loving to let the man go on doing that. It's not loving to him. It's not loving to you. And if there's kids involved, it's not loving to them. No, here's where love needs to confront. And if that confrontation doesn't work, you bring others in and you confront. And sometimes in extreme cases, love means walking away because maybe that's the only way that they're going to get it. You follow me on this? Uh, now, every situation is different. So you have to, in every situation, pray about what God's will is in that situation. What does love look like in this situation? And it's good to have other people have their eyes in, in discernment involved in your, in your situation. But the point is that hupotasso does not mean mousy meekness all the time. Sometimes it's confrontation and sometimes it's even walking away. Having said that, I can't possibly exaggerate to you How radical, how wild it is for a first century male Jewish person like Paul to be telling other people, men in the first century, patriarchal culture, to submit to their wives. To say, wives, submit to your husbands, that makes sense, but husbands, submit to your wives, that is as, in first century context, that's absolutely bizarre. Radical. In fact, it'd be subversive because they thought, in fact, the early Christians were known as undermining family values for this reason. The whole, thing, uh, the whole structure of society hangs on the authority of the man. And now here Paul is saying, husbands and wives submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's radical. It's wild. To say, wives and husbands, you esteem the other person above yourself. Wives and husbands, you submit to one another. Wives and husbands, you put off selfish ambition. Don't seek your own will. Wives and husbands, Come under one another, hupotasso one another, value one another above yourself. To say, to say to wives, that was normal. To say to husbands, whoa, that's radical. And so you see how now the kingdom completely reverses the Adam paradigm, the Genesis fall cursed paradigm uh, uh, that we saw in Genesis 3.16? In the fall, here's the diagram. In the fall, in, in the fallen structure, you have got the husband trying to have authority over the wife. The wife then tries to control the husband. Uh, those arrows represent trying to have authority over one another. They're not like playing bows and arrows here. They're, they're like trying to, it's a game of leapfrog where everyone's trying to control everybody because they have selfish ambition. They want to get their way. But in, in the kingdom, it goes in the exact opposite direction where the husband comes under the wife and then the wife comes under the husband. There's, there's this, this servant attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That applies to marriage as much as it applies to any other relationship where you're coming un- under one another, saying, how can I serve? How can I value you? How can I esteem you above uh, myself? There's a humility that is there. And see, then that now kingdom marriages, rather than being power struggles, become displays of Christ-like love. Now our marriages should be putting on display to the world. What does it look like? 
when a brother and sister in Christ, because remember, your brothers and sisters in Christ and Abba's family before your spouses. And, and so what does it look like when two people are, are, have their whole allegiance to Abba, Father, and are seeking to carry out Abba's will? What does it look like when two people who are married are free from all the silly distinctions and identities and allegiances of the world? What does it look like when two people now put on display the character of Christ and have the mindset of Christ and no longer are seeking selfish ambition but are seeking to serve one another? And that, folks, is, 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 is one of Abba's wills for marriages, to put on display his character and his love that are revealed on Calvary. Now, okay, now it gets a little thicker, okay? Follow this. That's the ideal for kingdom marriages. That's the ideal. But the kingdom always comes to people and always comes to cultures as they are. There's another way to do it. You know, You've you got to come to where, where, where people are and where cultures are. The kingdom, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed that gets planted in a person and gets planted in a culture and starts off very small, but it, but it, it grows and it grows and it grows and, and, and it, it gradually takes over the whole garden. It gradually takes over the whole person. It will someday take over the culture. It will someday take over the world. That's the kingdom growing. But it doesn't happen all at once. It takes a while to change people and a while to change cultures. So what you find in the New Testament is the mustard seed of the kingdom pushing at and subverting the categories of the world. Right? You find it's a mixture of both. The kingdom in a cultural context, transforming the culture and transforming the people in the culture. And so when the kingdom comes in the first century, it has to come and be expressed in the categories that are already there. Are you following me on this? It's got to be planted in the structures of the society as it finds it in order to push those, those, those structures out and eventually subvert it. So, Paul has to adopt the language of the culture and the, and, the, and the categories of the culture in order to instruct kingdom people on how to begin to live different from the culture. Are you following me on this? Are you following me on this? Okay, keep your thing caps on. So you can see this. You can see this when you look at the rest of Ephesians 5. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, the way, way Paul does this. Uh, okay, so let, let's go back to this submit to one another verse, and then we'll read how it, what, what follows from it. First, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Applies to both. Then he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, I put submit yourselves in verse 22 in brackets because they're not in the Greek. Those are inserted uh, in, in, in almost all the translations. But there's a significance in the fact that they're not in the Greek, and here's what it is. Paul says in the original Greek, husbands and wives, submit yourselves to one another in reverence to Christ. Then he says, wives to your husbands. And then later on, he's going to go husbands to your wives. What it shows is that, that the submission clause applies equally to husbands and wives. They just do it differently because they're in different positions because of the culture they live in. So Paul is first going to talk to the, the wives because they're already submitting. They have no choice. And then he's going to talk to the husbands. So he says, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, here's how you do it. Husbands, here's how you do it. So let's look, look what he says to the wives. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the, of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I thought a man would say amen. Is that crying out loud? Okay, okay look at it. If you take that verse, if you take that verse out of context, which it almost always is, if you take it out of context, it looks like Paul is reverting right back to the Adam paradigm, right? It looks like he's saying, yep, the, hus the husband's the boss. As though he forgot that two verses earlier he said submit to one another. If you take that verse out of context, you've got to be wondering, well, what about all that stuff you just said in Philippians 2 about we're all to have the mind of Christ, we're all to esteem the other person above ourselves, we're all to, uh, you know, be servants, uh, we're all to put off selfish ambition. What about all that? It looks like Paul's contradicting himself if you take this verse out of context. If you don't take it out of context, you'll see that that's not what he's doing at all. Uh, he is speaking in the categories of the culture, but he's subverting them. It's brilliant. It's ingenious the way he does this. Okay, so wives, here's how you do it. They're actually we're already doing it that way, but, but he, or, uh, they're actually we're already submitting, but now he's going he's, he's to bring something to it. Then he turns and speaks to the husband. Who in the first century has all the power? 
So he says this, husbands, here's how you submit. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with water through the word. So right after telling wives to submit, Paul turns to the husband and says, Husbands, you love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her. He, this is the ultimate hupotasso. He set aside all of his divine power and he became a servant and came under the church. Husbands, this is how you're to submit. Uh, in the first century, you got all the power. The question is, what are you going to do with it? And Paul is saying, set it aside and serve your wife as Christ set aside his power and his privileges to serve his wife, the bride of Christ. And husbands, notice this. They're going to husbands now. Uh, Christ gave his life for us, for the church, to make her holy and to cleanse her. In other words, Christ gave his life for the church when she was unholy and when she was dirty. Which means, if we're to love like that, we don't get to decide whether they deserve it or not. Even if we think the wife doesn't deserve it. Even if she's unholy. Even if she's dirty. Even if you think she's nagging you. Christ calls you to submit and to lay down your life uh, and, and, and bleed for your wife. This is how husbands are to submit. It's brilliant the way he does this. Uh, it put on the mind of Christ and transforms everything uh, in a marriage. And I suspect there might be a, a man listening to this somewhere out there in the podcast world who's getting irritated with me right now and, 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 and wants, wants to beat me up right now, but I want to speak to you and just say, it could be that maybe I'm, I'm challenging an allegiance that you have uh, and an identity that you have that in the kingdom you shouldn't be having. So let it go and, and be nice to me. All right. <laughs> so, so do you see what Paul's doing? It's brilliant. He, he speaks to the wife. They're already submitting. They don't have a choice. So when Paul says, wives, submit yourself to the husbands, that's nothing new. The culture was already doing that. What's new is Paul says, do it unto the Lord. What's new is that Paul's saying, do it willingly. Do it in a way that's not manipulative. Do it in a way where, where it's manifesting the love of Christ. That's new. That's radical. That's kingdom. And then when Paul says to the husband, you know, you, you're the head. You're head. You're in, the, in, in the first century culture, you're in the position where Christ is over the church. You got all the power. That's not new. To say you're the head, that's not new. That's just cultural. Everyone already knew that. What's new and beautiful and radical is what Paul says to do with that. What are you going to do with all that power? You're going to be boss? You're going to be the, have the tie-breaking vote? You know, Paul says, don't, don't do what Adam did. Lord over, rule over, subdue. No, no, don't do it like Adam did. Do it like Christ did. The mind of Christ. What did Christ do? Had all that power, had all that privilege, set it aside, emptied himself of it in order to become a servant to win over the love of his spouse, the bride of Christ. That's the relationship that husbands and wives are supposed to have in the kingdom, and it's beautiful. Mutual submission, mutual service to one another, mutual manifestation of the mind of Christ, uh, setting aside selfish ambition. So the question is this, and I'm going to do a little exercise here. It applies to marriage. It applies to all of our relationships. If it helps you to close your eyes as I do this exercise, Fine. If not, that's fine too. Right now, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, husbands, wives, single folks, to reveal to you ways in which maybe you've been operating out of the fallen paradigm. You've been operating out of selfish ambition. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you ways in which you maybe try to get your way in relationships. Ways that maybe you try to control or to manipulate, connive, strategies that you have for getting your way. Holy Spirit, reveal this to us. For some, it might be using your loud voice to intimidate. Holy Spirit, reveal to us. For some, it might be you just stop talking and you know that you'll eventually win. For some, it might be you start crying. That's how you get your way. For some, it might be the intimidation of their physical strength. How do you get your way? The Holy Spirit, reveal it to us. How do we operate out of the old paradigm? And just get a picture of that. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to us. Lord, help us be honest with ourselves. How do we manipulate? How do we control? And then when you see that in your life, where you do this, just turn and repent of it. Repent. That just means you turn from it. Turn from it. 
because you know that that's not the kingdom. And then let the Lord give you a picture of what does it look like when you don't do that? <laughs> what do you look like when you're not trying to manipulate or connive or get your way or control? In your marriage relationships? In your friendship relationships? Maybe in your work relationships? Holy Spirit reveal it to us. Sometimes it's so hard to see this stuff because we, 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 we've always done it. The Holy Spirit revealed to us. And we let it go and now grab hold of the, the true you. The true you. The you that you are in the kingdom. The you that doesn't need to be controlling. Mm, Holy Spirit reveal it to us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. All right. And then let's just ask the, the Holy Spirit to empower us to live that way. You see it? That's the true you. Now commit to living that way and ask the Lord to empower you to, to go in that direction, to live that way. Yes, Lord, empower us. To have the mind of Christ. To find the joy of serving one another. To be free of the need to manipulate and to control. Mm. You know, I, I was going to, I, when I initially thought about this message, I thought about uh, having something like you know, five practical tips on how to build a strong marriage and six practical tips on how to work through conflicts in a productive way. Um, and I just rather, now, because this is so foundational, I wanted just to give the paradigm of it. But in reality, this, you could not get a more practical message on marriage or just on relationships in general than the one you just got. The reality is, is if we have the mind of Christ in a marriage, you're going to be working towards a beautiful marriage. If you put this into practice, you're going to be moving in the direction of a beautiful marriage. Wherever you are now, it's going to go in the right direction. If, if, if two people start esteeming uh, the other above themselves, valuing the other above themselves, putting the other's interests before themselves, you're going to be moving in the direction of a kingdom, Christ-like, beautiful marriage. It's the most practical thing in the world. And if two people commit to having all their allegiance to Abba Father and, and, and all their identity in Abba Father and letting go of all of our little idols, if two people are doing that, you're going to be moving towards a beautiful marriage and you're going to be finding ways of, of working out through conflict because conflicts are going to be there. I don't care who you are, how holy you are, you're going to have conflicts. But they'll be productive if the two people always keep in mind that their job is to put on display the character of Abba Father. Um, and and, and the, the thing that erodes marriages and the things that, that makes conflicts sometimes seem insurmountable is people are operating out of the old Adam paradigm. We're still hanging on to selfish ambition. We're still trying to get our way. We have priorities that, that come in front of, of doing Abba's will. That's what erodes marriages and makes conflicts seem insurmountable. But when we commit to just being Christian, <laughs> being Christ-like, it's that simple. And husbands, Christ-like to your wife. Wife, Christ-like to your husbands. Friends, Christ-like to your friends. And then being Christ-like even to your enemies. When we do that, well, that puts on display the beauty of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. The beauty of the kingdom. Radical stuff, radical stuff. That's beautiful stuff. The kingdom changes everything. Okay, I want to end this way. Uh, I'm going to end with a prayer, and I, as I do, I want to invite the prayer team to come forward, and if you have, are here and have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, whether it's your marriage issue or your single issue or any other issue, I encourage you to come forward and talk with these folks and pray with these folks. Everything you share will be held in confidence. But I'd like to end with the prayer this way. If you're married, whether your spouse is here today or not, would you please stand up? And I want all, all the single people just to... Uh, get around these married folks. Are just, I want you to look around and just pick out in your mind two or three married folks. Look around so the people in the back are covered, people up front are covered. Pick out uh, a few of these folks standing here and let's pray for them. Because Lord knows we need prayer in our marriages. Man, marriages are under attack. So uh, Holy Spirit, we right now, if you want to even raise your hand towards the people you're praying for, that's fine too. Holy Spirit, we pray right now in Jesus' name for all the marriages and families that are represented here in this auditorium right now. Holy Spirit, we pray, God, that you would clothe their marriage in Christ Jesus, that you'd clothe each one of them in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would just baptize them in the spirit of Jesus, baptize them in the spirit that finds joy in sacrificing for, for one another. Baptize them, Lord God, in that power to let go of selfish ambition. Baptize them, Lord, in the attitude where they esteem one another above themselves. Holy Spirit, we pray protection around all of these families. 
Because there's an enemy that's out there that wants to get in and erode and, 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 and bring in this, this the tyranny of manipulation and control that's been there from the fall. But we stand against the enemy. We declare victory over the enemy. We rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name on behalf of every family represented in this auditorium. And Lord, we just pray then that you would just invade these families. Lord God, empower them with your love. Help them to rekindle the flame if it's been dying. Uh, Lord God, just, just let it burn more brightly. God, we just pray that each of these families would put on display the character of Jesus Christ. What it looks like for a brother and sister to be free of all the silly idolatry of the world, the identities of the world, the allegiances of the world, the hostility of the world, and to live in the beautiful identity of being kingdom kids who carry out their marriages and everything else in their life uh, to bring about the Father's will on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and build the kingdom. Amen.